to thank the organizers for the invitation to, to be here. Um, so Anne's talk was focusing on the way genes and substrates and catalysts interact within cells, the way they uh, create networks, the way you get the flow of carbon from one place to the other in, in plant cells. Uh, what I want to talk about is the next level up in the scale is cells themselves and how the different arrangements, the properties of cells can be used to create different forms and how we might be able to engineer things. Now, with plants, we have a, a kind of close relationship with plants on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and it's usually in the garden or in the supermarket. And here we've got a picture of uh, a range of vegetables, of course, cauliflowers, um, broccoli, cabbages, etc. And you might be forgiven for seeing this picture and thinking, well, they're quite different plants. But rather, these are all the same species. These are species or varieties that have been derived by breeding and selection from a common wild species. So this is a wild mustard plant. And through you know, many millennia, often, of breeding, all of the common crop plants that humans use have been derived from natural antecedents by virtue of continual selection and breeding to create very different outcomes. And these, are all, these plants are all derived from these same uh, ancestral plant, where you've got, say, floral meristems or vegetated meristems uh, creating different arrangements of cells in the context of a, of a growing system to create very different outcomes. And I show this picture to emphasize the plasticity. So even as you see in metabolism, the different flow of, of, of a genetically controlled flow of carbon into different substrates, at the cellular level, you see the arrangement, the rearrangement of cells during development, during growth, to create different outcomes at the, the end point of, of these developmental processes. And I want to show this image from the BBC Natural History Unit, which shows here this is a leaf that's growing. And as you see in this accelerated time-lapse image, you've got this leaf and this stolon or stem-like arrangement, which is growing from the tip of the leaf. And as it grows, you'll see this small nub of tissue here which itself will continue to grow and expand. And I use this as an example to describe the kind of illustrate the dynamics of growth. And this of course is a plant structure which is emerging, growing and creating this large structure. As you see it growing, you can see it forming the pitcher of a pitcher plant. And I think partly without human perception is not good at understanding or, or conceptualizing what happens at the scale of plant growth because plant growth is a little bit slow for us. So we're used to morphogenesis in, or, or movement in animal systems. But in plants, of course, we take them for granted because they don't do this very quickly. But when you start to see things accelerated, uh, crammed together, you can see the dynamics in a very concrete way. And I think it illustrates, for me anyway, the processes that are going on inside this process where there are literally millions of cells initiating essentially from a single cell to create this structure, with it, which is a very defined and, uh, and, and a constrained structure. And of course, this process of morphogenesis is driven by growth. And it's driven by the growth and dynamics of individual cells interacting as a population or society. And so at the root of this process is this in cartoon form. So we have a plant cell here, which is um, grown and is about to divide to create two daughter cells. And I use this cartoon to illustrate a couple of the salient features of plant growth which make it different to animals and help explain why plants look different from animal systems. So plant cells are immobilized. So just like the macroscopic plant which is rooted in the ground, plant cells are immobilized. They have this extracellular matrix which locks them in place with their neighboring cells. So you have a single cell here which is attached to its neighbors. As it divides, it will form two daughter cells by essentially subdivision. So the new wall that's formed is actually built inside the existing cell to create this new cell wall structure. And these two daughter cells and all of their descendants will be locked together for the life of the plant. So this boundary here, these cells can of course can continue to expand by division, but this boundary marks a clonal boundary which will not shift because these plants can't move. The plant cells can't move with respect to each other. So this also brings another consequence, which is that because of the immobility of these cells, there's a relationship between 
the properties of cells and the local cellular anatomy. And if you imagine going back to that pitcher plant, which starts at a single cell and grows, and you've got millions of the cells all coordinating their behavior to create this final terminal structure. And it's composed of these individual elements in the population, individual cells, which are of a particular type at a particular time. And we know that in the case of plants, plant fate or gene expression is largely controlled by interactions. It's the neighboring interactions which tell plant cells what they're to be, and in return, those cells will communicate with their neighbors. And it's this social interaction which, and the passage of genetic information between cells in a local fashion, which controls gene expression. And so there's this network of exchange of information which takes place between cells within that growing pitcher plant. And it's that network, that population, that social interaction, which describes the properties of that final structure. So here we've got a cell which has been, obviously schematized cell, which has been uh, essentially told or promoted or programmed to divide. So as it divides, it forms two new daughter cells. And those two daughter cells are in two different positions, of course, with respect to each other. So each cell will pick up different information from its immediate surroundings, from the cells around it. It will also deliver information to those surrounding cells, which will put those surrounding cells in a different context. So by this kind of binary fission, you're creating a breaking of symmetry, creating new information, which can then use, be used to feed back on the process. So the, the whole process of building a pitcher plant is a highly parallel and feedback driven process. It's much more like the process of organization of a social network or an economic network or a political network than it is like constructing an airplane, for example. So the, most of our conventional engineering paradigms are based on blueprints. You have an endpoint that you uh, specify. You then have parts that you assemble to create the individual elements, the subsystems, and final product of what you, you know, this final endpoint. In the case of our biological system, we need a DNA program, which is not just implemented in a cell, but implemented in millions of cells, and where the key is not so much what is encoded in that individual cell, but how those cells interact with their neighbors dynamically across this process of emergence, building a population which is growing by, by division, proliferating, and at the same time building, putting in place interactions which self-reinforce and bootstrap this final process. And of course, the process that we're talking about is a source of the most organized structures that we know. Uh, the human brains in this room each started from a single cell and end up with trillions of connections by virtue of this kind of bootstrapping process, this local process. And of course, if you look outside the room, if you look in terms of human constructs, our social constructs are some of the most complicated things that we, we, we know. And they're not designed as such. They're not based on a blueprint. They grow, they emerge from local interactions, just like an economic network does. Uh, based on local transactions, and you've got this process of growth. So I think it's, it's actually quite a deep problem and a very broad problem. Um, and I think in the case of a biological system, you have the huge advantage that the kind of interactions that we can build here are based on parts which have molecular specificity. Of course, the kind of biological parts that we can create have the uh, the level of accuracy, molecular specificity and accuracy, which is beyond almost anything else that we can machine or create and using evolved systems. Anyway, this will hopefully become more clear as, as we go on here. And so the, this whole talk is about trying to get towards a process where we can engineer cell populations to create some kind of supercellular structure. And as you'll see, most of the talk is about microbes. It's not about plants. It's about taking systems which are as simple as possible and engineering at the lowest level DNA parts and other interactions which can come together to create more ordered structures. And so we adopt this kind of, it's a, it's a variant of the engineering model, if you like, where you've got a, a test uh, or a, a build design, build test cycle. But in the case of a biological context, our, the parts that we're using, that we design, are based on DNA, DNA elements that are there in, inserted into cells by virtue of transformation. And so we have a biological system which we then need to be able to interrogate 
and derive precise parameters from. And those parameters can then be used to uh, parameterize um, computational models, which can then be used to design improved circuits, hopefully. And in our, in, in, broadly in the synthetic biology field, there's this paradigm which has been referred to already, which is, is, is I think is certainly correctly underpins the whole business of synthetic biology, where you start with DNA elements in a biological context, you can modularize or abstract DNA-based functions as parts. These can be put together to create devices, larger scale devices, circuits and systems and implemented in a multicellular context. And these processes, this hierarchical view of systems, I think works. It also comes with the, the kind of principles that are found in every form of human engineering, the benefits of decoupling design from fabrication and the abstraction that comes with uh, creating standardized elements that can be used, where you get the social aspect of building complicated systems by using uh, abstraction as a way of going forward. And I think just segueing away from the, the, the problem in, in more precise biological terms to this more general aspect of how do you create um, a, a way of going forward here if you're trying to tackle this quite ambitious problem. And if you go back to 1958, this is a picture of Jack Kilby's first integrated circuit. It's, it's quite a famous image of the, you know, the first circuit in what became Texas Instruments. And there are five logic devices on that rather crude device. And as we, this is 1958, by the early 60s, you had the formulation of precise physical and electronic standards for the way these kind of devices could be put together in larger scale circuits. And this diagram shows going from Jack Kilby's circuit through the first planar transistor through to the first uh, integrated circuits. And now a modern microprocessor, modern integrated circuit will have uh, four, five billion logic elements on it. And this process of moving from very simple architectures through to more complicated structures started, of course, the way we are sort of tackling things in biology, which is often with hand design, uh, using um, a direct interaction with the, 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 the substrates and the, the design principles where you've got individuals who are designing processes where they have to know everything. They have to understand the whole process of the biological components that they're using. They start with raw nucleotide sequence, which they synthesize, they assemble this, implement it in a biological system, where we're, we're certainly at this stage. And certainly in the electronics systems, you, had, you move very rapidly from manual design and assembly through to a computer-aided design process, which Patrick mentioned earlier. And clearly we're in this process of trying to assemble the tools which allow us to handle complexity in a, in a reasonable way. And I think this slide, in a way, encapsulates both the challenge and the opportunity for physicists and mathematicians and biologists to come together in, in a way that I, I'm sure we haven't quite plumbed the depth of the, the, the kinds of interactions that are feasible here. But uh, clearly the opportunity is there. But there's one thing that I want to emphasize also in that the superficial similarities between, say, semiconductor assemblies and design and biological systems breaks down very quickly. And if you think of individual circuits in an electronic context, compared to the kind of circuits that exist in biological systems, you have um, insulation and, uh, um, and a, a top-down design process for electronic circuits. Whereas in a biological system, and this could be either at the genetic scale or the cellular scale or population scale, you have networks of interacting elements which are often not insulated. That the kind of, in a, in, if that's, for example, a genetic circuit inside a cell, all of the components have access to all of the other components. So that you require molecular specificity to derive and separate elements from each other. And so, for example, here we can have um, a circuit which is essentially comprised of identical elements which are simply wired up differently. And here in the biological context, we need a different element for each of the logic components that you're using inside that cell. And I think this is in a way, well, both obvious but also important because it also highlights the potential benefits of working with cells rather than genes. So if that's a genetic circuit, then you're constrained where each one of those logical elements needs to be insulated by molecular specificity. 
if you're working in a cellular context, there's a natural form of insulation where cells are the, the unit of gene expression and the interactions between cells are necessarily more limited. And it's those connections which provide the edges between these nodes in this kind of network. So they're much simpler networks because of the physical arrangements of cells. And this will become uh, very clear as we go on. So the question is, if you have a network of interactions, so you have a, a eukaryote cell, it might have 30,000 genes, you want to install a circuit where you want to examine the behavior of one of your synthetic genes in that circuit, what do you do? Well, of course, there's a revolution in cell biology with the use of these fluorescent proteins which come from corals and jellyfish, which now have a quite an elaborate um, palette of different colors. And these directly visualizable proteins, of course, are genes that can be used to insert into a circuit similar to a flag in a computer program. So you can look at the behavior of individual genes uh, inside, a, um, uh, inside a cell. And so if you imagine that, well, you can do that, of course, you can put your gene in. We would commonly use, look at, for example, if you wanted to look at a population of cells, and this is a real example I'm gonna show you with bacteria, you can insert a single gene for a fluorescent protein, have these population of bacteria, bacteria growing inside a small container, being observed in an automatic fashion in a, say, microplate reader, where you can get multi-parameter measurements very accurately, continually, you can get uh, very accurate measurements of, say, for example, increase in fluorescence or increase in the optical density of the culture as the cells proliferate. The more cells there are, the more light scattering there is, the more the optical density goes up. So you can, and you can have multiple fluorescent proteins, for example. So you can use this to measure, say, for example, two genes and the relationship between those genes and what they might be doing in a particular circuit as these cells are growing. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in this sort of S effort to try and create computational systems which create cellular interactions is to get at the lowest level, understand what individual parts are doing and to get intrinsic values or estimates or measurements of what, say, promoters are doing or other circuit elements are doing inside a cellular context. But here we're not looking at individual cells. We're looking at a population of things. And the process of creating fluorescent proteins schematized here. So here's our gene. Here's fluorescence at the end of the day. But of course, if you're looking at a, a, a biological system like this, which is about as simple as you can find, in that cuvette or that well, the process of getting fluorescence and you're looking at the transcription rate, which is actually the intrinsic value that we want to get out of this system, is what of these promoters are doing to, and what the rate of that transcription rate is, is creating in terms of amount of RNA, which is then translated to make a protein precursor, which then needs to be matured and folded to create the fluorescent signal that we can measure in the machine. So in order to get to this point, we have to also deal with various um, side issues. These genes are in cells, on chromosomes in cells. The chromosomes are dividing, uh, are proliferating. The cells are dividing, they're also proliferating. You've got transcripts which are, are being made, which are also being diluted by cell growth. They're creating proteins which are being diluted by cell growth. And there's degradation rates, of course, for all of these comp com compounds. So we've been struggling with how to express these processes in a, in, a, in a formal way, but also in a way that allows one to make measurements, that allows one to interpret the data and combines a description of the process of gene expression and production of something you can measure and allows us to get to an intrinsic value at the end here. So one of the first things that, that we've uh, discovered both experimentally and theoretically is that the product of, of, the, um, of fluorescence, the thing that you're actually measuring in these devices, <laughs> Is a, has, there's a linear relationship um, between this, uh, the, the rate of accumulation of the intensity and the absorbance, if you, the, the ratio of those two um, is, 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 is a constant product. So if you have, for example, a construct, a plasmid that you make with one of these fluorescent proteins on board, growing inside a cell population, which is then proliferating inside a, a, a cell, you can see, for example, that over time, the absorbance, that is the amount of cells in that, that cuvette, will increase with time and then flatten off as the growth rate finishes. At the same time, the amount of fluorescence uh, will also accumulate with time. 
and it will follow a similar kind of trajectory, not quite the same, but similar. But if you then express this, these two functions, uh, essentially the, the rate of accumulation of fluorescence and the rate of accumulation of absorbance and plot them against each other, you get a straight line relationship, which makes it easy to measure. And this provides essentially well, um, a, a parameter that we call alpha, which is essentially an estimate of, for a particular condition, what proportion of the cell's effort is going to make this fluorescent protein and the rate at which it accumulates. So what, what is being devoted essentially uh, to, the, to the, con the assembly of this, this fluorescent product, which is a, a reflection of the intrinsic value of the promoter that drives this expression, since that's the main variable in these experiments. And that gives you a view of, um, of, of the, the um, a value of the, for the intrinsic um, ability of this promoter to create or drive expression. But when you start looking at these values and then changing the conditions, you get a lot of variation, which is due to the difference in load on the cells, both because you're creating some kind of output, you're now using here either different carbon sources or using cytostatic agents to create different loads. And the promoters themselves will respond differently according to the, the kind of perturbation that you see inside the system. And so, for example, the amount of variation, which is due to, say, in this case, for the media um, or for um, a, a experimental other experimental features, is that the vast majority of the, the noise, if you like, the variation in the experiments, comes from extrinsic processes things which are outside and not related to the way the promoter's working, but rather to the way the cells are operating, the way that the cells are feeding themselves off the media or the way other <laughs> extrinsic processes are moderating this process. And so what we've done is to take a, a, another process where we take these values for the intrinsic value of the promoter and then have two genes, now looking at the, a test gene with respect to a standard gene where a standard gene is, um, as a promoter here, is a fixed reference point, and then we can correct for ex other extrinsic variables by comparing the alpha values for each of these two, two genes. So we have this factor rho, uh, which now, where you're looking at very different um, media properties, you still re retain these straight line relationships by looking at, by using this uh, ratio metric estimate, which essentially, uh, um, corrects for the, the transcriptional load and the other, the, the, the essentially the um, uh, extrinsic factors which affect cell growth as opposed to the intrinsic value of the promoter. And so if you look at the variation now, um, where you correct in for these extrinsic factors, you can remove a lot of the variation which is associated uh, with this external, uh, you say for example, the different media, which is shown up here as well, is now smoothed. And this is our standard promoter up here is the, 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 of course, is sort of fixed value, but you can see also for the other promoters, you've, you've got this intrinsic value you can use uh, for circuit design. And so you have this um, relationships now, which, which you can have a, an ex a value for the intrinsic properties of the promoters, which can be used for design. And so when you're looking at this level of, of uh, say, for the nanometer scale, if you like, where you've got genes, you've got gene elements which are interacting, gene regulatory networks, you can start to develop ways of measuring um, parameters that can be used for modeling. And the rest of this talk is really about trying to move up this scale. So it's all very well to have a, a gene regulatory network which will operate inside a cell, but then what happens after this? How do we get to a, a, a reasonable way of modeling or understanding cell behavior and then think about patterning those processes on a larger scale? So you can see here, there's, in this, the scales here which run from molecular to cellular to population, run, run from nanometers to microns to millimeters, and run from seconds to minutes to hours as a, as a rough estimate of the, the kind of scale of elements that we're, we're trying to model. So in the case of, of the cellular scale, this is an image from a confocal microscope which shows a field of bacteria. So they're just simply taken out of a shaking flask, put onto a microscope slide and visualized where they're yellow because we've got both of these two different colors of fluorescent proteins that we're measuring inside these cells. And you can see even in this population of cells, there are um, variants in size and color, depending on the different behavior, genetic behaviors inside the, inside the systems. And you know, this is essentially this idea of stochasticity is, is embodied in this slide, but there's also the spatial aspect. 
Because, of course, bacterial cells in many of the circumstances that we want to work with them are on a solid substrate or in some other uh, non-homogeneous system. So this shows a couple of colonies that have grown on an agar plate and have merged at the end here. And you can see here the individual cells, again, the stochasticity of, of gene expression and the physical arrangement of cells inside the, the colonies. And in a way, this is an analog, a very simple analog of what happens in plants as well. So if you're thinking about bacterial cell growth, you have this slight quandary because those of you who have done any microbiology will know that if you plate individual cells on an agar plate and come back the next morning, that single cell will have grown to make this very regular hemispherical colony, geometrically very regular, but the, the way it gets there, the way it produces that regular colony is anything but radially symmetric. So for example, bacterial cells like E. coli or bacillus have a bacilliform shape and they grow uniaxially. They don't go in a, in a radially symmetric way, they grow uniaxially. So the growth of a cell is mediated by this extension in a, in a single axis, find, followed by septation, uh, and this septation is mediated by uh, Turing-like systems, the min proteins, which will calculate the midpoint for the cell. And so you end up with a, a capsule-like process where these daughter cells are created and then undergo the same process again after the cells separate. So if you think of modeling that, and what we've done is to create physical models for this division process, you can start with single cells. This shows part of a few um, sequences in a, in a time-lapse sequence where we've got cells, individual cells growing. And in a friction-free environment, of course, if you plated a single cell like this and came back the next morning, there'd be a single colony, one cell wide and several meters long, uh, which would be the res result of this cell just undergoing its axial extension. But of course, in reality, you can't extend indefinitely. The frictional forces build up, so you generate buckling processes. Uh, which are well described in many physical systems, these kind of uh, processes. But here it's driven by growth, growth of individual cells. And as these cells grow and form these columns of cells, they buckle. They buckle very quickly and they create these effectively rafts of cells. And you can make out as these mini or micro colonies are growing. This is a, mo this is a simulation at this point, but we see this in the same thing under the microscope. You get these buckling processes that create um, cells in opposition cells which are, have easier or more difficult ways to grow, and you build up physical tensions or forces inside these uh, small microcolonies, which create uh, inhomogeneities inhom and create uh, um, um, fractal-like patterns, as we'll see in a minute. So this model, um, for those who are interested, is a, a model, it's a GitHub uh, open source software package called Cell Modeler, which is online, and that's the website there, cellmodeler.org. And you can create, it's a three-dimensional model, and it's based on rigid body kinetics. Um, this shows the microscopy data. This is real cells growing under a microscope, under a cover slip on soft agar. So you get the cells growing to form these microcolonies. This shows a computational model showing similar kind of process where the cells are growing and pushing against each other to create these constrained uh, three-dimensional arrangements. And so you can grow colonies, um, you can grow hundreds of thousands of cells if you want. I think this one has about 50,000 cells on it. And you can simply grow those processes. But what's more, you can also mark the dynamics of the process. You can visualize what happens during the growth process. So if you take this little microcolony and tag the, f so after the first two divisions, you start from a single cell, two cells, four cells, and at the four cell stage, if you color those cells and then watch their daughters progress through the growth process, this is what those four cells have created. The clones of those four cells have created this fractal-like arrangement in this, these early colonies. Because of the underpinning uniaxial growth of the cells and because of the physical dynamics and the competition between cells, you end up with these different uh, directions and uh, nature of growth. Sorry, I didn't hear the first bit. It's a nutrient situation. Uh, unlimited. So these are tiny colonies. Wait a moment. Unlimited nutrients, but they create a change of environment. And this may be changed all the situation. Yeah, I think in, in these cases where they've got on a rich nu nutrient medium, we don't see any limitation of growth at this early stage. Now, wait a moment. It could be that pH value changes. Uh, these are all possible, but... Uh, this is a 
we go to the real stuff. So we go with the experimental data and we always tie together theoretical observations with direct experimental ob observations. Sure. But I think at, at a first approximation, clearly these things happen. But at a first approximation, we see similar phenotypes where we don't have nutrient limitation in the small colonies, which are only an hour or two old. And so for... A different state. Yeah. A different state. Sure. So this shows, for example, an image of, of mature colonies that are after an overnight growth, which have been densely seeded on a plate. And we've got three different sort of species of bacteria, which have red, blue, or green fluorescent uh, uh, proteins that are being expressed. And even here, you can see where the colonies have collided early. You get these fractal-like boundaries being formed. And the nature of confocal microscopy is that you can go and look at these quite in, in, in detail. So you can zoom in very effectively, identify subsets of the field, and zoom in to look at the individual details. And as you zoom in, you can start to see individual features here. And you can see the kind of behavior and arrangement of cells uh, due to these fractal boundaries that are being produced. And so these are, these are real. Uh, these are not a model. This is real data, real cells. Um, and we have uh, colonies, well, methods now for creating split colonies. This is a model, not, not, not data. So you see these fractal boundaries being produced as a result of two cells segregating a plasmid, or actually two plasmids segregating into two daughter cells at the first step of in division. And we can also do that in vivo. So I think I've got the next slide, but we can use not just um, the the, the different um, colony assays, but also start to use different bacterial strains. So this is a, a mutant of E. coli. Uh, it's called the Rod A mutant, which creates spherical cells. So as a defect in the uh, nature of cell wall growth, it forms spherical cells. It doesn't have the same kind of uniaxial growth. And this shows um, a colony, a small colony, growing inside some normal wild type cells, which are marked in the blue here. And so you can create these split colonies this is, this is, again, is real data, this is not, not a model, where you've got plasmids, one bearing a red fluorescent protein, one a green fluorescent protein, which are segregating at the first point of division, and the consequent daughter cells are interacting at the boundaries to create these fractal-like boundaries. In the case of the Rod A mutant, where you've got these uh, roughly spherical cells, you get a much smoother boundary, um, and you see the fractal dimension is, is, is much lower in, these, in this case. And this shows, again, colliding colonies so this is a clonal sector, and these are colonies that are growing together. And you see the fractal boundaries in one case and smooth boundaries in the other. Uh, and again, the models uh, back this up as well. Uh, as well as this, you can also start to explore these models by looking at adhesion. So this is a, a wild-type microcolony. This is a bacterial strain that is now expressing under arabinose control um, uh, one of these um, adherent genes. This is a um, antigen 43, which is a gene that is, or protein that is exported to the outside surface of the cell, and it allows aggregation between cells. And this aggregation creates these kind of extended processes where the cells, once they contact each other, um, form an aggregate, and then are push, pushed away from each other. Uh, and that's both found in the physical model and in the, the microscopy data, the experimental data. So we've got all these different potential contexts, and we will try to use these, in fact, to create a plant-like context, where I mentioned plant cells where they aggregate and uh, form an, an extracellular matrix, and we're trying to use the combination of spherical cells and cells that adhere to each other to create more plant-like processes, but these are, these are quite difficult to work with because they're very sick cells, but that, that was our, our, our part of, partly our goal in this. So we have this, these models for cellular interaction, and that allows us to look at the, the scale of, you know, the, the sort of micron scale in interactions between cells. But if we want to move towards um, population-based interactions, we have to move up in scale to sort of millimeter scales. So we've developed this, um, quite, I think, quite interesting system for experiments, which is very simple, but it's based on use of membranes, which have this this black stuff here is a hydrophobic ink, which is printed onto these filters. And the hydrophobic ink allows the bacterial populations to be inoculated and to grow on the hydrophilic patches between the ink and form these small quadrants of homogeneous bacterial populations, which can then interact 
from population to population where the geometries of the bacteria are highly constrained, so they can only grow within that, that geometrically constrained quadrant. Uh, and you can generate longer distance signaling interactions. And we've used a number of different signaling processes, but focused mainly on the quorum sensing signals, which is about as simple a signaling system as you can make between two cells, where you've got um, this, the, the, these are these uh, homoserine lactone producing enzymes and receiving enzymes. So you've got a two enzyme system, one of which is the catalyst that produces the signal. The signal will diffuse across membranes uh, and it moves directly from one cell to the next by diffusion. Uh, and there's a protein that you can express, a cognate protein that you can express inside the cells, which will recognize this, dimerize, and then bind to DNA as a, a, on the basis of that dimerization catalyzed by the interaction with the, uh, the signaling molecule. So you can start to create systems where you combine these quadrant-based filters, where you can inoculate different cell types onto the filter, and you can then use um, the genetic circuits to condition the signaling across these systems. So this is actually the control over here where we have cells that are, um, are, are receiving a signal. In this case, it's a particular homoserine lactone. I won't go into details. Uh, but that signal then diffuses from a source across the membrane and triggers a response um, in the adjacent cell quadrants. And these, you can digitize these, and so you see the, the signal being conditioned as it diffuses across the system. And this is in, uh, uh, this is, these are about, so that would be about 20 millimeters, uh, no, about 10 millimeters from there to there uh, across this quadrant, series of quadrants. And here we've got a similar kind of experiment where we've got the same kind of signal diffusing from one end of the filter into the, the other. But here we're looking at a system where we've got a signal that's being responded. These cells are conditioned to respond to this, but there's a negative feedback interaction with an alternate signaling process here, which I'll describe in a minute. And that gives you a conditioned signal where you get a much sharper cutoff uh, between the cells that are receiving the signal and those that are not. And there's a, a feedback relationship there. And so the kind of signals that you can make, and we've got now in this diagram, we've got two different signals. So we've got these AHL signaling systems, but now there's two of them, and they're hooked up, they're connected. So we've got a signal system here, which is so a, a system which is producing a signal, which cannot be received by the same cell, but it can be received by the other, the other side of the circuit, if you like. So you've got two signaling systems, call them A and B, where A needs to be received by the B conditioning cells, and the B conditioning cells produces the A signal. So you have the a relationship which is governed by um, propagation of a signal, if you like, where A can signal to B, B can signal to A, but they can't signal to each themselves. So you have a process where you can create sort of a, a leapfrog arrangement where this cell type will signal to those and vice versa, but not, not, to, it, not to themselves. So if you start out with a system like this, if you've got a short range interaction, these cells can interact with each other if they're close to each other because they can then interact and feed back on each other, create an excited state by virtue of mutual induction. If they're separated, that doesn't happen. So here we've got a, essentially a checkerboard arrangement on this quadrant arrangement. We've got cell types A and B across the whole field. and They're too far apart to excite each other. Whereas here, we've seeded the process with a mixture of these, right in the center of portion of this checkerboard. These are all mixed with A and B signals. Um, and here we've got this, this process um, amplifying and then spreading as cells signal to the adjacent quadrant. The adjacent quadrant produces the opposite signal, which then signals to the next one along. So you have this feedback regulated propagation of a signal across centimeters across the filter based on these local interactions, which are then propagated across the material. And of course, that's using this leapfrog based process. You can also do the other. Instead of having mutual induction, you can have mutual competition. So for example, if you have a system where we have now our two states, A and B, but now repressing each other rather than activating each other, you create a very different logic where if you have cells which can be preconditioned to be in state A, they will inhibit state B. So they will promote themselves and repress the opposite state. And like similar to this one is here. So the B state will repress the A state, but will excite itself. And this is the, the circuit. I won't go into details of the circuit down here. And all of these are visualized by virtue of these fluorescent proteins that we're using. <coughs> 
And so in this case, if you have one of these filters, because of the nature of the system, they're isogenic strains, but you can either push them into state A or B by giving them the signal. And so these cells are preconditioned into state A or B, decorated onto the filter, along with a field of cells that are un unconditioned. So they are neutral in their, in their process. And this particular circuit, they tend towards the green state, we'll call that the A state. But here we've, we're starting out with these preconditioned cells, and as they are allowed to grow across the system, these uh, cells in, in red, the B cells, will continue to propagate, will have a signal that then spreads to adjacent quadrants. Those cells will be recruited to the B state. And so you get this recruitment of cells to this, this state, and you have this um, boundary formation as they're competing with cells of the opposite state. And so you have this population-based effect with a very simple circuit. And uh, I think this is the kind of testbed that we want to take and use to create more complicated circuits, to create the kind of systems that sort of describe schematically up here. So for example, if you have an AND gate expressed in this population context, so an AND gate, of course, you can use in a, within a cell, have two different molecular functions that can create um, a state as a consequence of the interaction. In, the, in a population context, where you've got states A and B coming together to create a new transcriptional state by virtue of an AND function, you can create state C, for example, as a you know, new transcriptional state. And the idea that A plus B equals C plays out in a population context to create the kind of creation of a novel band of cell types, which of course can then be also the, used to bootstrap another set of interactions based on the interaction between C and B and C and A, so the whole process can reiterate itself in a way that's quite familiar to you know, say segmentation or um, other patterning processes that developmental biologists would, would be familiar with. And I think this idea that you can start to think of quite simple uh, ways of dealing with patterning uh, is, is quite interesting to us at least. And the, one of the other implications here is that these patterns which I think it comes to a, the way humans deal with things, that this is the kind of element that you can deal with because a lot of the complexity is underneath the process. So you can start to think of these being described phenotypically in a way that's hierarchical. And if you start to put those simple systems together in different order, you get different outcomes. And this is just a very simple example here. We've got two patterning processes, which are completely theoretical and arbitrary. So one is a radial patterning process, and one is a bilateral asymmetric process. And if you take those processes A and B and in different order, so the idea that you can capture this idea and have a transcriptional state as a result of one type of patterning and use that to trigger the next form of patterning. So here we have radial patterning where the outer state here is now undergoes um, bilateral patterning. And here we've got a bilateral patterning followed by radial patterning where one of the transcriptional states in each case is active for the next step in the process. And of course, you end up with very different outcomes depending on the order with which you um, apply those different patterning processes. And so I think this is quite an interesting test bed for ideas that could be implemented in plants. And of course, but if you think about plants, you've got issues here. Plants are slow, the generation times are slow, they've got complex genomes, there's often a lot of redundancy in systems, they've got diploid or polyploid genetics, Tissue culture and regeneration is quite slow and difficult, and complex tissue morphologies, which makes it really quite difficult to look at early simple stages, and, and they're quite difficult to analyze at the cellular scale. So one of the themes of our work, and I think it's through the, the microbial stuff as well, is that we're interested in simpler processes, and almost to the exclusion of almost anything else, that we'll go for simple uh, systems, biological systems, where we can get direct measurements. And so we've chosen to go with a lower plant called Marcantia polymorpha. And the lower plants, that is, the, if you go back 500 million years, the first plants that emerged into the terrestrial environment were not dissimilar to these lower plants, which are still with us. Um, and you've got these very <coughs> flat arrangements. There's no shoots, there's no roots, there's no flowers, there's no seeds. You have a very different mode of growth for these lower plants. But they are packed with all of the genetic equipment that you see in higher plants, pretty much. So these are haploid, they're not diploid, they're haploid, like E. coli and yeast. They have male and female plants. This is the male plant here, and this is the female plant. 
If you cross them, you end up with not flowers and seeds, etc. You end up with these uh, as a product of the crossing sporangia. And so they make not seeds, but spores. So each one of these sporangia has about a quarter of a million spores in it. So you have from a single cross, you can make millions of progeny. Those progeny look like this. They look roughly like um, yeast cells. They have you know, all these energy containing vacuoles full of oil um, and they can be stored at minus 80 for indefinitely. If you put them onto agar media, they start growing. So they grow into these, if you go back one, so this is what they start out a day later or so, they look like this, where the plasters, the chloroplasts have started to differentiate and they're much larger. After another day or day and a half, they start dividing. You can see the first division here. This is one of the ungerminated spores. So after about a day and a half to two days, this is the change already, uh, and the change accelerates. So you get the formation of differentiated cell types. This is what passes for a root in these lower plants. This is a rhizoid, so they're just single cells. And you can see this continuing cell division at the top here. And as they continue growing, this top part of the, the plant, the photosynthetic plant, elaborates to form a flattened sheet. And so after about a five to seven days, you have this flattened structure, which will form this flattened sheet which is the, uh, the body of the plant with these giant cells, which are the roots of the, of the plant underneath it. And so you end up with this flattened structure which continues to grow. This gives you an idea of scale. So there, instead of having a bacterial or a yeast colony, you've got a little baby plant after you've um, spread this, the spores. Um, and as it continues to grow, you, you look at the top surface in detail and it has this very modulus architecture. So you have repeating three-dimensional units, which repeat one after the other in a uh, identikit fashion. And so each one of these units here has one of these donut-like structures. This is an air pore, so this is the photosynthetic unit of these lower plants. I guess you could call it the equivalent of a leaf, but it's separated into these small identical chambers which are spread across the top portion of the, the, the plant body. And it has this very nice, simple three-dimensional architecture, a pore for gas exchange, highly photosynthetically active cells inside a hollow chamber which undergo photosynthesis. On the bottom of this green surface, which has this on the top, you have the, what passes for roots in these plants, so these single giant cells which emerge from the bottom surface. And on the top, you start to see specialized structures like this cup-like structure here. And you may notice that you see these small photosynthetic chambers on the top surface. And inside here, you can see these very unusual um, asexual propagules which form inside these um, these cup-like structures. So this, this is a cross-section of the cup-like structure. So they start from single cells which grow inside these cups and create these sort of little groups of, of propagules which grow to a certain size and then fix their position. And you end up with a structure like this, which is one of these propagules. And inside you've got this cell specialization that takes place, which is easily observable uh, by microscopy. But the key thing is that the process of growth is directly observable. So similar to the E. coli colonies that I showed you, you can observe growth, and this is from day two to day three, of growth or germination of these asexual propagules. They grow very quickly. And you can use image processing techniques to take images from day two and day three. Here we've stretched day, th day two image with a, a warp registration algorithm to make it fit over the top of day three. And then you can match them, overlay them, and you can see that now the, the two images are overlaid on each other. And what's different between them are the cell divisions that have taken place in the, the subsequent 24 hours. So they show up as red lines here, which you can see more clearly here. So you can measure or visualize cell divisions uh, quite clearly inside around one of these apical notches. So you can visualize cell dynamics this way. Of course, you can segment and quantify the pr process of growth. And you can also map gene expression onto this. And so you can see these small gemma. These are some of the uh, promoter fusions, synthetic promoters that we've been using to mark genetic processes on top of the physical processes of growth. And so we have, we think, we're getting towards at least a plant-like system which embodies some of the benefits of working with simple bacterial and yeast-like processes, not just with the physical and direct observation of the systems, but also in terms of a genetic modification. And to summarize, what we are aiming to do and what we think with this Marcangi system we are in a good position to do is to start getting systems both for measurement of local cell properties, of the way those local cell properties 
uh, relate to interactions locally between cells, the way gene fates and gene expression are established by local interactions, and the way growth and uh, metabolism results in tissue-wide interactions with the chemistry and physics of interaction. And of course, there's a, a feedback within this whole process where individual cell properties and, and say the, the geometry of cells are constrained by the physics of, of tissue arrangements. The shapes of cells are governed not just by genes themselves, but their, their context inside the physical organism. And shapes of cells we know constrain patterns of cell division, are, therefore constrain arrangements. So there's, there's an unholy arrangement here where a lot of the complexity of the system <laughs> emerges from local interactions playing out across these multi-scale linked processes. And I think now with Marcanti, we have a system where we can encapsulate all of these processes in the same system in a simple way uh, using the <coughs> analytical techniques and models. Um, and I'll finish there, um, hopefully on a hopeful note. <laughs> and uh, just to give thanks to the people who are doing the work. Um, these are people still in the lab and the, the green folk are working on plants and the, the ones in darker text are working on the microbial systems. Um, and uh, to the collaborators, including uh, things which I haven't talked about today, which Anne alluded to in her talk, which is the Open Plant Initiative. And you'll see this funny plant spanner thing around at times. And that's really related to an effort to try and build open tools for engineering plants at, at different scales, both at the genetic and the cellular scale, and to have um, ways of distributing those tools in a more open fashion. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>